Welcome back to Success with Steven. My name is Steven Smith. And on this channel, we discuss uh, credit, personal credit, business credit, leveraging our financing and all things business strategy. Today, we're going to be continuing our removal of charge off series. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use your 1099C in order to remove a charge off from your account. I'm also going to be um, showing you how to find your 1099C without having to get it in the mail from the original creditor. And uh, this strategy I just recently um, started um, after doing a one-on-one -on -one coaching. I appreciate the one-on-one -on -one coachings, guys. The reason why they're, they're so good for me is because right now, since I'm not in the midst of doing my own personal credit repair, having to look at so many different uh, reports um, over and over and over again uh, over the, the like course of, you know, weeks and weeks that I have to keep doing it really keeps me uh, engaged, keeps everything fresh, keeps me coming up with new ideas, new strategies. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> but again, this is not a credit repair channel. I may have only two or three more videos for you guys. Um, that I'll have, yeah, probably two or three more videos possibly that may pertain to charge offs. Um, maybe even just one more. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, but just keep, keep an eye out. I'll probably let you know when it's the last one. Again, I think I may have one more at the very least before this is the end, but if not, then you'll see a few more, uh, to come. Um, now. Uh, using this method, it will require you to get access to your IRS transcripts, but I'm going to walk you through that steps to begin. Uh, so let's uh, get started. Let's get to the next slide. Before we go into the IRS tax transcripts, I just want to uh, give a, a brief description of what a 1099C is. Originally, we did this on the first charge off removal video, but I want to get back into it again and I want to do it right from irs.gov just to reiterate for people who may be new or did not see that video yet. So let's take a look at what the IRS defines a 1099C as. So we are on the um, irs.gov website about form 1099C cancellation of debt and file form 1099C for each debtor for whom you canceled $600 or more of debt owe to you if you are a applicable financial entity or it's an identifiable event that occurred. Now, this would mean if it's a charge off that is less than $600, you will not be able to use this method. This only works for balances that are $600 or above. Okay, so keep that in mind. Um, this also works for identifiable events that have occurred, such as a bankruptcy. That is one event um, that that would work for. The only person who can fill out a 1099-C or submit a 1099-C for you will be the original creditor. Normally, I would tell you to contact them, reach out, see if you got it. With this new method, you can actually check in real time if you have a 1099-C. Um, I'm just going to show you what the form looks like. Again, this isn't a form that you're ever going to be filling out yourself, um, but this is an example of what it's going to look like. It'll have the original creditor's name, their uh, tax ID. It's going to have the debtor's TIN, which is your social, your name, your address, the account number, the amount of the debt that's discharged, the interest, if included. Usually when you have a 1099C, they don't include the interest. They just include whatever the balance was that you used because um, when they file this, they're basically saying the amount of money that you had is income. So let me give you an example. Um, if I loaned you $800 and um, you didn't pay me back after, let's say, six months. So at the end of the year, when I file my taxes, I'm going to say, hey, I didn't get the $800 that I loaned to this person. Can I actually get a tax break on that $800? We would then file our taxes. We would get the $800 back in a credit from the IRS. And then 
you would now have to put that $800 as income because technically it was money that you spent that was never paid back. So a 1099C would technically be income for you. And then you would add that to your taxes and then you would pay taxes on this income that you have created. Here are the specific instructions on irs.gov for uh, form 1099C. The creditor's phone number must be provided. The creditor's information must be in the box. Um, do not file form 1099C when fraudulent debt is canceled due to identity theft. So you don't file form 1099C if the debt was fraudulent. So that just lets you know for, again, the original creditor, if it was fraudulent accounts, they can't get a tax break on that. You can't file it for that. Um, you're and you have to be an, an entity um, who uh, who is capable of doing this. Um, but for you, again, for the individual, we don't need to know that. That is something that's a criteria for the original creditor. Um, and form 10, form 1099C must be filed regardless of whether the debtor is required to report the debt as income. The debtor may be an individual, corporation, partnership, trust, estate, association, or company. Do not combine multiple cancellations of debt to determine whether you meet the $600 reporting re requirement unless the separate cancellations are under a plan to evade the Form 1099-C requirements. So that's just letting you know who must file um, and letting you know what the criteria are. And then I want to go back to one more thing. Let's just go back here to the PDF file and we're going to scroll down. So right here, instructions for debtor. You receive this form because a federal government agency or an implicable financial entity, a creditor has discharged, canceled or forgiven a debt you owed or because an identifiable event has occurred that either is or is deemed to be a discharge of debt of $600 or more. If a creditor has discharged a debt you owe, you are required to include the discharged amount in your income, even if it's less than $600 on the other income line of your 1040 or 1040 SR. However, you may not have to include all of the canceled debt in your income. There are exceptions and inclusions such as bankruptcy and insolvency. So here's a cool thing. If you are insolvent and most Americans are, you'll be able to claim insolvency on your taxes so that even if you receive the 1099C, you don't have to add it as income onto your taxes and then pay taxes on that. That's a, I feel like that's another video. Um, but that's just something to keep in mind. Like for example, if your dis if your debt that was discharged was a car and it was going to be an extra $25,000, you may want to file as insolvent so that you don't have to pay taxes on $25,000 of that following tax year. Just keep that in mind. Um, so the only box that I want to actually get into is box six. Box six shows the reason the creditor has filed the form. The codes in this box are described in more detail A bankruptcy. So just keep in mind, if you were bankrupt, you'll probably see a 1099C for a cancellation of debt. Now, because you were bankrupt, you can then also um, you actually won't have to pay taxes on that or file that as income in that circumstance. But this is one of the reasons you may get a 1099C. Um, you may also get it for stature of limitations. It expired uh, for the period of time that that debt was supposed to be owed, i.e. the seven years, seven years that can no longer be reported or that charge off can't be reported. Uh, debt relief from probate or similar proceedings. Um, and uh, other actual discharge before identifiable events. So these are just different things that you can look at when you're looking at the 1099C form. I just think it's a good idea to know exactly when you're supposed to get one, the requirements that are uh, th that need to be met to receive one, and how your original creditor is supposed to fill this out. Uh, just to make sure that everything's being done properly. The other part of that being, um, you know, filing your taxes, 
Uh, I'm not going to go over that. You would want to get with someone um, who is going to be handling that for you. But just know that if you did have a large debt and you were you were going to have to file that on your taxes as income for the 1099C, just be aware that if you're insolvent, you do have an option of using that to not have to pay that debt back. So just keep that in mind or not to pay that not not the debt back, but the taxes that would have been due on that debt. OK, I hope that makes sense. So now that we've gone over that, let's get back to the slide and I'm going to take you to um, another section of IRS.gov where you can actually find your 1099C. Now, this is going to be the fastest way to check for a 1099C. Now, the only thing is this is going to be with a lot of accounts that are, you know, already old. You probably already previously filed your taxes with these accounts. So you may not necessarily uh, see them if this charge off happened this year. Uh, you may have to call and actually find out. And usually you won't see a 1099C if the account was charged off in the same year, because of course they have to wait till the following tax year to receive a credit. So more than likely if it's a new account, this won't work for you, but it's just good to be aware of where to find it uh, if the time comes that you need to look for it. So the website is https colon forward slash forward slash www.irs.gov forward slash individuals forward slash get dash transcript and I'm going to actually put this in the description so you can click the link but you can also screenshot this and then you can click on it to go there so when you go to the website it's going to say get tax record so on this website link you can access personal tax records online or by mail but of course we want to get it the fastest way possible so we're going to get it online so you can go um, to the get transcript online button and you're going to click that now this is going to ask you to sign in with id.me if you're not familiar with id.me it's a verification um, account that a lot of government agencies use to verify your identity uh, you you've probably seen it before especially if you're in the military you you're familiar um, or if you've ever had to verify something with the government then you probably have an account if you don't have an account then you can go to create a new account id.me and then once you're done with that then you would come back here and you would sign in so I'm gonna get signed in and then we're gonna go to the next step now when you get signed in you're gonna see this screen it's gonna say IRS welcome with your name and it's going to say get transcript. You're going to select a reason you need the transcript. For the most part, all the reasons that I selected seem to not really matter. Every time I selected any reason, the same information seemed to come up. I live in the state of Nevada, so we don't have state or local tax, um, but we do have federal taxes. So I'm just going to click on federal taxes because everyone, if you're paying the IRS, you everyone has to pay on the federal level uh not necessarily on the state level all right so when you go here it's going to actually have all of your transcripts and what you guys will find interesting i'm not going to click on it because then it would be so much information i'd have to mask i already took a screenshot of the account that i'm going to use for the example it was one that i had a 1099c4 but you're going to go to the wages and income transcript and you're going to pick the corresponding year. Now, the thing is, mine goes all the way back to 2014. It usually goes back nine, 10 years from what I've seen. Um, you can actually uh, check each one of these. And depending on how old your account is, you probably don't need to go back 10 years, of course, for the in most situations. But if you go back, you can actually look and see if you had a 1099C, depending on the account. Now, the one that I'm going to look at, I believe is from like 2018. So it was, you know, a few years ago. So you're going to want to go through here. When you scroll through, it's going to have all of your income information everywhere that you've received money from, uh, whether it was your job whether it was uh, if you were trading stock or anything like that and you were and you had and you realized some capital gains, um, whether it was not like for me, um, 
I'm a musician. I've had music from streaming services. So TuneCore collects that for me. They had that on there. Like anywhere that you would have money and you get a tax document for the money that you've made, it's going to be on here, which will include a 1099C. Because remember, a 1099C is income. That is income for you because you spent money and you didn't pay it back. They now deem that as income. All right. So now that you've um, seen this page, take your time. You can go through your wage and income transcripts and you can see exactly, you know, everything that you've done. And then you should be able to see 1099C. And then we're going to go to uh, the slideshow and I'm going to show you the example of my 1099C that I had. All right. So this is my form 1099C cancellation of debt. This actual form was associated with a Wells Fargo credit card that I had. Now, the Wells Fargo credit card, um, it was it was a fairly old account. But the account actually got canceled December 31st of 2020, December 31st, 2020. Now, the amount of debt that was discharged was six hundred and seventy two dollars. When I went back and looked up the account, the account had a higher balance than 672 but what i realized was the 672 was the amount that i actually spent on the card they don't actually discharge interest and they don't discharge bank fees so keep that in mind if you have a an account that is like let's say like in my situation it was a thousand dollars but the amount of the account was not more than 600 without including fees, you may not get a 1099C. It has to be at least $600, not including any fees or interest charges, okay? $600, it has to be for the balance that you spent. Just keep that in mind. So the identifiable event code is creditor's debt collection policy. And the debt, the debt description was a credit card. A personal liability indicator box checked personally liable. All right. So this is exactly what it's going to look like when you're scrolling through your wage transcript uh, for your IRS for the um, IRS.gov for that transcript. When you're scrolling down, you're going to see form 1099C and then it's going to say cancellation of debt, just like this one does. It's going to have the creditor. It's going to have the creditor's um, uh, federal identification number. And then it's going to have a little short description of the creditor of their address. Like my name, Step Smith, doesn't have my full name. It doesn't have my full at my full address. It did have the last four of my social. I just um, masked that. And then let's go to the next screen. Now, what you're looking at here is the account. Now, this was an old Experian um, report. And this is from September 17th, 2020. When I went prior and I looked at um, I looked at December 21st, 2020, this account was already removed. So I don't have that. Like I can't I couldn't show you like exactly where it was at that time. It was already off my credit report by like, I think, October. So this was the last time that it was actually on there. But as you can see, I've only ever had one Wells Fargo account. So I know that this was the, the account that was associated. Um, the balance was 1043. But again, that was the balance with interest and bank fees. The actual amount that I spent was 672. It wasn't the 1043. So when they discharged the debt and they did the cancellation for the 1099C form, um, that's why you only see 672 and you don't see 1043. Like as, like, as you can see, like my, my limit was 1000. So, I mean, I know that happens sometimes where you could spend more, but I didn't spend more than what the limit was. Um, and this was a very old account. As you can see, it was open June 23rd, 2011. And you just had stuff on here from 2014 all the way up to 2020. So yeah, it just, it was a very, 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 very old account that was, really hurting my ability to obtain credit um so that's i mean that's that's pretty much all the information that i had on this account 
and essentially you would want to take both of these screenshots you want to go to irs.gov you would get your transcript you can do exactly what i did here and you can screenshot or you can send the entire page if you want and you're going to have this showing that the account was canceled right and even though you know this amount is 672 you want to just you know just make sure to add something so that you can let them know that it's the same account because of course this account number here shows the last four of the account number and then the one here shows the first few numbers which is weird like it's backwards right but i do know that this is the same exact creditor um and then you want to take a screenshot of this information as well all right that way you have the 1099c cancellation of debt and then you also have the account where you can show hey this is the same account that's reporting to my credit report and that way you can compare both of them for the credit bureaus to see and for the original creditor to see okay now this is the verbiage that we're going to be using when we're disputing this account so this is the verbiage according to the irs an unpaid charge off is income remember an unpaid charge off is income and according to the fcra income cannot be reported on a credit report i received a 1099c cancellation of debt for the following charged off account listed below you can then put the account number again with the series of x's that's perfectly fine you can put that in the name of the account after checking my most current report the updated information stated this account was still being reported this account cannot be reported as a charge off on my credit report. Please cease the reporting and delete this account. That is the verbiage for this um, for this particular type of dispute method. We're not doing a round one, two or three. We're taking this verbiage and we're disputing it directly with the creditor. Right. Because the creditor is the one that's reporting the information. So they should have stopped reporting the information after they uh, charged after they discharged that debt and they filed that 1099C form on their taxes. They should have stopped reporting it. OK, so this is that, you know, besides that, the double jeopardy method, because it's very similar to this one. It's almost the exact same. Um, besides those these two different methods, you should go through the round one, round two, round three process for these particular two methods. You're not doing that. You're going to use this 1099C form. You're going to um, you're going to use a copy of your report for comparison. You're going to send this verbiage directly to the original creditor because you have to understand more than likely there's no one who is literally going every month. OK, Stephen Smith going to update that credit report collection or charge off there. There's no one physically doing that. This is happening automatically uh with a machine with a program with a software this is happening automatically so sometimes you have to let them know that this is still going on and this account's still being reported so they can stop reporting it sometimes it's just that simple they just need someone to tell them that this is reporting when it shouldn't be and they will just cease the reporting um like for example the one that i had that was definitely written like 1099c it was canceled this just like the Capital One, when it happened, I never got a notice from Experian or Equifax or TransUnion that the account was deleted. The account just went away. It was like a ghost. It just it just was gone. No one, I didn't get any alerts, anything. It was just gone because the original creditor did not report it that next month. So it was just gone. Nothing left. Okay, so that's that's the difference when you're trying to dispute it with the credit bureaus and when you're going directly to the creditor in these circumstances, only in those two circumstances that we talked about, would we have done it this way? OK, um, before I take the verbiage over to the CFPB, I just want to go over some more information with um, as far as uh, income and 1099 C's. So I found um, an old article from Experian. It's also in the FCRA, but I was spending a lot of time combing through it and I couldn't find the exact uh, section I was looking for. So I found this instead. So um, 
you have if you ever pull up your credit report, doesn't matter which credit bureau, you've never seen your income on your credit report, right? Some of us would want income on our credit report because if let's say you make a lot of money, I make two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. You know, I make a pretty decent amount of money. I would want a bank, a lender, someone who I'm trying to obtain, obtain credit from to know how much money I'm making. But notice whenever you're filling out an application, you have to state your income. You can you never you don't see your income on your credit report. You have to state it. You have to tell them how much you make. You never see it on a credit report. Right. So updating income on a credit report. So right here, dear Experian, I'd like to complete my income information on my credit report. How can I do this? So it says right here, dear RYD, you can't. Your credit history does not include income information. While employment information can be part of your credit report, it is limited. Your creditors may report the name and address of your employer and possibly the dates you work there. That information is usually provided by you in the credit application. Remember, credit application, when you tell them that you work for so-and-so company, you provide the employer. That's how they get that. That's how that information is provided. Lenders must verify that you have the ability to repay a loan, um, a loan. So when you apply for credit, you will be asked to provide income information, but the income details are never reported to Experian. Again, Experian tells you right there. But the income details are never reported to Experian. The bottom line is that just because a person has a lot of money doesn't mean they will use that money to pay their debts. So the likelihood that a person will repay their, their debts is based on how they've paid previous debts, regardless of income. So essentially what this article is saying you don't have income on a credit report because how much money you make does not dictate how often you pay back your money. It just says I make a lot of money or I don't make a lot of money. It doesn't actually tell me whether or not you pay bills on time. So it's not included on a credit report. And as you can say, it's never reported. Right. So then let's go back so again back here. The IRS, the IRS says. A 1099-C is income. You you went to your IRS transcript and you read yourself a 1099-C is a cancellation of debt. But now that I use that money, my creditor, the creditor canceled it, but I have to pay taxes on this money now. I have to actually put this on my taxes and pay tax on it because it's now considered income because I didn't pay them back. So if you're if according to the IRS, an unpaid charge off is income and the FCRA or the example that we use directly from a credit bureau, income cannot be reported on a credit report. So I just want you to see how this is how we come up with this verbiage. The IRS said this, the credit bureaus and the consumer law said this. So if income cannot be reported on a credit report and I receive the 1099 C, which is a income statement, the following charge off account can't be listed on my credit re report because this is income. <laughs> it's that simple, guys. It's, it's, it's really that simple. So um, whenever you see that, that's all that you have to say. This is actually this isn't this isn't charged off debt anymore. This is income that I'm going to file on my taxes. You can't report income on a credit report. You said it. Y'all just you just read it. You just said it. I can't do that. You can't do that. So now the information needs to be deleted. And that's it. It's as simple as that, guys. Very, very simple. It's not complicated. It's very easy. And I like to make this um, feel as easy as possible because I know that information can be overwhelming, especially when you're getting it from so many different sources. And um, I just want to make it as easy as possible for you and easy as possible for me. If I'm doing this, I don't want to I don't want this to, to be hard. So. Now that we've gotten our tax transcript, we have our ver our verbiage, we have an understanding of what we're trying to explain. We're going to take the copy of our transcript with a screenshot of the 1099C cancellation of debt. We're going to take a screenshot of the account being reported to our credit report, whichever bureau that it's reporting to. 
and then we're going to go to the CFPB and I'm going to show you how we're going to submit this as a complaint to get this um, charge off account removed from our credit report. All right, we are now on the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, again, if you're new to my channel, you haven't seen this yet. My follow, my subscribers already know. We're going to scroll down to the bottom. We're going to go to start a new complaint. All right, from here, if you don't have an account, this is your first time seeing this screen, fill it out. Uh, you sign up, follow the prompts there. For the rest of us who have created an account before, we're going to go to the uh, blue highlighted text and we're going to log in. Once you log in uh, to the top, uh, right hand side of the screen you'll see start a new complaint you click that button it takes you right here to step one for submitting a complaint you're going to click on credit reporting or other personal consumer reports and then you're going to click on credit reporting and then um in step two and i'm going to be honest with you guys there are multiple different options that you can actually put for this and they would still actually apply um, like for example, you really could put problem with the company's investigation into an existing problem, or, um, you could put, uh, well, other than that, I probably would just use improper use of your report, which is the option that I'm selecting now. I just want to let you guys know, like for some of these situations, depending on what you're doing, um, you know, after you've done this a while, I'm, you can use your discernment for some of them. For this one, you could pretty much do problem with the company's investigation, but let's use improper use of your credit report, okay? Um, then let's do reporting company used your report improperly because we're talking about the company that is actively reporting this every single month, right? Because we're not going to dispute this with the credit bureaus we're going to dispute this with the original creditor because in this case, we need to get them to stop reporting it. And once they stop reporting it, it will be removed from all three bureaus simultaneously. So we don't have to dispute one at a time. We can just go right to the source and they're going to remove it. All right. So improper use of your report, which best describes your problem. Reporting company used your report improperly. Have you tried to fix this problem with the company? Yes, we have. Did you request information from the company? Yes, we have. Did the company provide this information? No, they did not. And then we go to the next step. So what happened? We're going to take our verbiage that we got from the slide. We're going to make sure that we um, paste that verbiage in there. You want to, in these parentheses that I have here, don't forget, add the account name and the account number. And it's okay if you add the one from your credit report that has a series of X's at the end. That is your account number. That is fine. You can add that. If you have the full account number because you have the original account information and you want to add that, that's also fine. All of that will be perfectly fine. You just want to make sure that the account can be identified. You want to make sure that Wells Fargo or the bank that has it or whoever the creditor is knows this is the account. And if they're reporting it as that on your re report, you can trust and believe that they will be able to find it with that information, right? And what would be a fair resolution? You can copy this last sentence right here. Please cease the reporting and delete this account. Simple, right? Where it says attach a document, you're going to add the screenshot of the 1099C or that page of the screen of the transcript that you want to include. You're going to add the screenshot of your credit report that's reporting that information. It, it doesn't matter if it's Experian or TransUnion or Equifax. You can send all three if you want just to let them know it's reporting to all three. Doesn't matter. You just want them to know that it's still reporting. Um, so you want to do that. You want to add a copy of your driver's license, a proof of address, which can be a utility bill, voter registration, your uh, your phone bill, your bank statement, your credit card statement, 
um because i get asked this a lot of, about what's acceptable um it could be car insurance um it could be internet bill you know it could be any of those things they all qualify it just has to be something it could be your w-2 you know what i'm saying it just has to show your address it just has to show that you live at that address um you want to include your uh, second form of identification it could be either a passport birth certificate or a social security card i just recommend that just so you don't get stalled out okay um if you can't find it it's okay put everything else if you don't have it it's okay put everything else and then proceed to the next step so when we're looking at credit reporting company in this case i'm gonna put wells fargo but you would put whatever the company is a majority of the time whatever company you're thinking of who whoever it is they're usually already on here they're usually here you it's it's very rare that you don't see a company on here but let's say that you didn't when you type in that company's name if you can't find that company um, or it doesn't automatically present you with a name you can type in a name and then you can type in the P.O. box or the information or the address, look up the address for that company, and you can manually enter it in. And the CFPB will then send this electronic complaint still to that company and they will receive it. OK. Um, you then add the last four of your social, your date of birth and your name as it appears to that original creditor. OK. So I'm just going to fill in some information here really quickly. All right. So in this situation, you don't need to, to complain about another, another company because we're complaining about the original creditor. Now, let's say you did this. And for whatever reason, because it just, you know, things happen. Let's say it didn't delete from Experian, but it deleted from, from TransUnion and Equifax. You can then go back in here later, and then you can do the dispute directly with Experian. But for all intents and purposes right now, you can just do it with the original creditor. Now, if you want to do it with all three, just for good measure, no, nothing's wrong with that. You can do that too. You can actually add three... Uh, three companies here you could add like Wells Fargo you could add Experian and you can add TransUnion now you can't add four companies at at one time but here's what you can do you can go through here fill out this entire complaint and after it's done if you have one more company left go back in do it the exact same way but add that last company all right just in case you just like for good measure, I just want to do all of them because it would make you feel better just knowing that you you made sure you exhausted every option. You you, you alerted everybody. If it, if it makes you feel better, you can do them all. Um, I'm just saying for for what I've done, I only needed to do the original creditor. But sometimes I just do all of them uh, with like one on ones and coachings or maybe I'll recommend that in like an email. Um, just because I know that some people really want to make sure that this gets done as soon as possible. But I, I just wanted to touch on that just so that, um, you know, it, it could save the question in case it was asked. Um, so, no, in this case, I'm not complaining about another company. And I'm going to go to next. So this is the very end of the CFPB complaint. Um, what I've been doing lately is just usually skipping this part because you have to always select myself. And step five is the end. It's just a review. They ask you for demographic information like your race, your gender, your family size, your uh, military affiliation. These are all optional. You don't have to fill them out. It should automatically put your address um, into the review part. You submit that, confirm everything is correct, and then submit, and you're done. You will get a complaint. It should have one complaint number. Um, if you submitted three, it'll have three complaint numbers, and you can log back into your account to confirm that everything is good. All right? 
once you get that, you will receive a confirmation number from a confirmation email from the CFPB. It normally says in 60 days, uh, this complaint will be closed. But as we should know by now, you can disregard that. Everybody gets the same thing. Everybody gets that same exact message. It's it's not to say now your complaint's going to take 60 days. That's not what it's saying. It's a standard uh, response that everyone receives. OK, once you get that response, you want to wait for a um, for an update on your credit report. Now, here's the thing. This this won't be a like this won't come as a deletion. So you may get notified like I noticed like Experian notified me because my credit score had increased. And then when I went to go look for the account, it just wasn't there. But I never got an alert that said this account was deleted like I do when I dispute inaccuracies. It just was gone. OK, so um, you'll just want to take a look at when you get notifications of updates like for most um, for most credit uh, reporting uh, or credit monitoring apps or services. If something happens where your credit score increases or decreases or something changes about it, you normally get alerted. If you get alerted of that, I would suggest just going directly to closed accounts, charged off accounts, wherever the derogatory marks are, see if that account is still there. If the account is gone, then you can just assume that the account was removed. Because again, this technically isn't a deletion because we're not actually getting it deleted for an accuracy the original creditor just stops reporting it and it just goes away. It's like just gone after it's just nowhere to be found anymore. All right. Um, please let me know how this strategy worked for you guys. Um, let me know if you had a lot of success by doing this method. Um, I, I do think that you're going to see a lot of higher rates of success. And what I am very happy about is um, seeing this and knowing that now you don't have to wait in the mail or you don't have to call, you can go to your IRS transcripts right now and you can see if you have a 1099C. I'm going to start uh, incorporating this into the beginning of the process, like updating personal information, um, uh, updating personal information, uh, you know, um, going through and do in, in, um, getting uh, your disputes and inaccuracies and on top of finding all of your inaccuracies that you can dispute going to irs.gov getting your transcript and if you have any 1099 C's for any of the uh, corresponding tax years let's collect those and we can start submitting those disputes as well to get those deleted really quickly so that's gonna just make it so much easier for a lot of people um, you know Having to do the round three process can take some time, but now this hopefully gets some deletions and charge offs very, very quickly in like five to seven days so that we can just continue and getting this thing moving. So, um, again, um, thank you for the one on ones. I learned a lot from doing that. I think it makes videos like these possible because I get to um, continuously be engaged with the same processes and learn new things when new information is presented. That helps a lot with um, making sure that I could bring good information to people. So thank you for that. Those have been great. Um, thank you for the purchases of the credit repair guide. Thank you so much. Appreciate that as well. Again, I don't think I'm going to have too many more charge off videos for you I think the most I'll have is three and at least I think I may be able to get one more out of it I have to go over it again and see if I have anything else that I could have possibly missed I, I, I'm thinking maybe I have one or two more things that I could possibly show you and after that I don't have any in, like any intent of doing um any more charge off videos per se. Cause I feel like I've t at that point I would have, I would have touched on a majority of the different types of charge offs and I will have given you almost every single method that you could get to remove it. And I, I don't think you're going to need any more. I think that's going to be it. Okay. Um, other than that, I think 
you know, that'll take care of that. That should take care of uh, that series, that charge off series. I'm going to continue also putting out uh, videos for business credit. I just recently got the um, I just recently got the Chase uh, business business ink card. Uh, I'm going to make a video on that. I was going to do it today, but uh, I, I think I'll I think I'll save it. I think I'll uh, give myself the break and I'll do it another day. And uh, then I have some other videos coming out about uh, business credit, uh, one on rewards. Today is. Today is April 14th, Sunday. So you guys may not see this video until like maybe April like around the 20th ish. Usually I make my videos. I would say sometimes I make videos two weeks in advance and put them out two weeks later sometimes. But I would say like for these, I usually put them out like a week later. Uh, so by the time that you're seeing this, it'll probably be a week old. I'll probably have more business credit videos. If you guys have any ideas of other things that you want to see, um, let me know. Uh, I am going to probably soon be showing you my new business what happened after like the first 30 days, where that's at, uh, business credit scores that came in, what I'm doing to continue my structuring and what you can do as well to uh, to get your business structured and what why that's important for you. And then I think I'm going to start transitioning over to the next phase soon, which is going to be uh, ways that you can make money online with your business credit. And if you guys are interested in like, for example, uh, never talked about this, but if you're interested in, let's say, YouTube, maybe you never thought about that. But YouTube as a platform, as a digital service, if you're thinking about maybe doing that, maybe you can leverage your business credit to get your equipment, to get your camera, to get started. If you want to know things about more about YouTube, the analytics side and things like that, I've never talked about it. If you want to know more information about that, let me know. If you want to know more information about eBooks and templates and maybe, you know, writing your own eBook, let me know about that. Someone mentioned making a website. Um, I might do that if I see there's enough interest in it. Um, if you want videos on, let's say, side hustles or additional ways to make money to supplement the income that you're going to that you're going to get, you know, in order to start your business, I can start doing stuff about that. Um, just let me know ex exactly where you are at in this journey and what's moving you right now, where your focus is at. For me personally, my focus has been a lot on uh investing etfs things of that nature another thing is uh i don't know if i forgot if, i probably mentioned this at some point in time i used to trade stock uh i used to trade day trade swing trade uh i do long-term investing if you want to know about day trading i have i have trading view i use trading view a lot for that i have indicators i have charts if you want to know good trading strategies good investing strategies um things like that how to read a chart how to use indicators if you want to know about that i've done a lot of things i do a lot of things i'm that's that that's one of my bags it's been a lot of years developing those trading skills too so if you want to see that i could definitely make something on that so uh please continue to provide me with your ideas um you know uh i i want to be as much of a resource as i can for you guys and just thank you for everything I appreciate you watching this video and you have a wonderful day.